In my last video, I talked about Scott McCloud's big triangle, and I made a lot of promises about what I'd talk about in the future. And, well, I'm going to make good on at least one of those right away. McCloud's triangle exists in understanding comics in large part to discuss the prevalence of a particular style of visual art that makes up the overwhelming majority of comics. Cartooning. So, what's up with the cartoon? I'm Andrea Gilroy, and this is Comics Crash Course. So the word cartoon is tricky because it has a lot of meanings and connotations depending on the context. As we discussed way back when, cartoons started life as a loan word from Italian for a preliminary sketch for a final project, only to shift into a term for a satirical illustration thanks to Punch magazine. McCloud uses it to differentiate between single panel cartoons and real multi-panel comics. It can refer to that low production quality but imagination shaping Saturday morning animated fair and, well, any animated fair. And regardless of the visual style, and despite McCloud's differentiation between cartoons and comics, for a very long time, comic artists refer to themselves as cartoonists. It also refers to a style of illustration, and especially when you add a few letters to the end and talk about cartooning. So that's what we're going to focus on today. Cartooning is a style of illustration that is still representative, but is simplified and usually exaggerated. And that exaggeration is often, though not always, used for humorous effect, meaning that the overlap between cartooning and caricature is often quite large. This style of drawing is at the center of Scott McCloud's incredibly influential definition of cartooning and understanding comics one that boils down to three words, amplification through simplification. So this whole thing actually goes back to the big triangle. You see, for McLeod, cartoons are more toward the conceptual point of the triangle, while what he calls realistic drawing moves more toward the mimetic point. And he argues that because a cartoon is more conceptual and less representational of some real object, they are essentially more, well, universal and that explains their power. Their simplification amplifies their meaning. He argues that the human tendency of anthropomorphism, especially pareidolia, which is when you see faces everywhere, that points towards an inherent tendency to seek out identification. The more conceptual an image, the more blank the slate, and the easier it is to pour ourselves into that image. I think this is a pretty compelling argument, and I certainly notice myself doing these sorts of things. An interesting example of McLeod's point comes out of the Franco-Belgian comics history, where during the 1950s, there were two major schools of comic styles. One was the Brussels School, which came out of the journal Tintin, and the second was the Charleroi School, which centered around the journal Spirou. I'm going to focus on the Brussels School, which was influenced largely by uh, Tintin, um, the creator of which was a man known as Hergé, who pioneered a style known as Lynn Claire, or Clear Line. The whole point of Lynn Claire is that, well, its line is very clear. <laughs> the weight of the line is even across the foreground, middle ground, and background, and is also the same weight regardless of whether the artist is drawing a detail or a main figure. The overall effect is really interesting. It's this sort of coloring book kind of look, and it's also really, really clear and super easy to read. And that's um, part of the point. Uh, Tintin was meant to be an educational comic in which the young reporter would go to different countries and report back to Belgium on his adventures. Of course, if you've read a lot of Tintin, you know it changed quite a bit over the course of the series, but the style was developed to serve this educational purpose. And one of the things you see is that the world of Tintin is quite detailed and carefully rendered, even if the color is flat. But the main characters, and especially Tintin himself, are very simple, super cartoony. The trick of the even-weighted line is that it makes the cartoony figures look like they fit in this super detailed world. There's not this tension between the detailed world and the super cartoony characters. And it seems to also have this effect that McLeod claims. Tintin is this sort of universal figure. It doesn't hurt that he has very little personality. It's really easy to identify with him 
to have him as a familiar touchstone you can hold on to while experiencing the exciting new world he visits. Now, while I agree that there is something very powerful about the conceptual nature of cartoon images, especially the more simplified ones, one of the things McLeod fails to account for is that his universality is, ironically, incredibly culturally specific. And that's one of the reasons I chose to look at Tintin. Because not only is the clear line style a really useful example of the kind of amplification through simplification claim, but the Tintin series is also known for its cultural imperialist attitudes, especially in the early years of the series. Tintin is a white European boy with Christian values, and guess what? That is what gets to be universal. Everything that doesn't fit with that is other to different degrees. And while a person that doesn't look like Tintin might identify with him, that's largely because cultural pressure has forced us, myself included, I'm a woman, to identify with certain so-called universal standards. Take, for example, this cartoon, ostensibly the most universal thing, right? A human. Uh, but this is male, right? Keynote says that's male. Female? At a dress. Now it's slightly less universal, even though I almost never wear dresses. Another example. In this early sketch of Franklin from Peanuts, you can see Charles Schultz working out the character's look, particularly playing with his hair. Schultz worked really hard on this character, speaking with African-American friends and fans to make sure that he avoided stereotype. Now, you can tell it's Franklin in this picture, but when he would appear in the strip, his racial otherness would be marked with lines on his skin. Part of this is representational. Franklin's skin is darker than Charlie Brown's, and those lines show that in black and white. But I showed the sketch to prove that it's not entirely necessary. You still know it's Franklin without the lines. The point is that conceptually universal isn't actually universal. It's culturally dependent. And to underline the point that so-called universality usually reinforces particular cultural values having to do with race, gender, class, religion, etc. You see, in order to simplify a representation, to create a cartoon, an artist needs to rely on visual shorthand. And that visual shorthand is built through centuries of tradition based on the values that I just mentioned. What parts of the face are worth emphasizing? What parts can be ignored? What's considered beautiful? What's considered ugly? For example, McLeod's smiley face ignored the nose. But if a culture considered the nose a really important part of beauty or a key aspect of expression, maybe that simple face would include a nose and not a mouth. One more example is manga. I'm often asked why people in manga and anime look white. But that's because in the Western tradition of caricature and cartooning, brightly colored hair and wide round eyes indicate whiteness, while Asianness is traditionally denoted with almond-shaped eyes and dark hair. Now, manga has an entirely different visual tradition. To a Japanese reader, a character in manga looks as Japanese as Belle from Beauty and the Beast looks white to us. Now, neither of them have particularly realistic proportions. But in Japanese texts, white characters actually have different markers. So that's one of the fascinating and sometimes troubling things about cartooning. While the seeming simplicity of the cartoon as a concept leads us to believe in its universality, the practice of cartooning actually reveals a ton about the inherent values of a culture. As with everything, the simple stuff is often so much more complicated than it seems. More next week. See you then.